Prehistoric man in America, Dean Harris. Prehistoric man in America again by Dean Harris. Go to chapter three of this book. The Pre-Christian Cross. Very Reverend W. R. Harris, D.D. We go to page forty-nine. It says here the cross in ancient America. When the Spanish missionaries learned soon after the discovery of America that the cross was worshipped in Mexico and Central America. They did not know whether they ought to account for its existence and adoration among these strange people to the pious seal of St. Thomas, the Apostle of the Indies, or to the sacrilegious subtitly of Satan. Sahagún in his Cronica de Nueva España informs us that the cross was an object of worship in the great temple of Cozumel, Yucatán. He writes at the foot of the Tower of Temple, there was an enclosure of stonework, graceful and turreted, and in the middle was a cross, ten palmos high. This they held and adored as the symbol of the god of rain. In 1878, the French anthropologist Desiree Charney discovered an abandoned and ruined city in the country of Lacandones, Chiapas. By a strange coincidence, Charney met here the English explorer, Mr. Alfred Maudsley, and his companions. This newly discovered ruin is supposed to be the Phantom City of Stevens. This Phantom City, according to Charnay, and his Ancient Cities of the New World, Chapter 22, stands on the left bank of the Largarnitos River in a region hitherto unexplored between Guatemala, Quetzaltenango, and Chiapas. Among the strange things discovered in the Great Ruin, Charnay tells us of a bas relief which he describes in his book and from which we quote, it fills the central door of the temple and is three feet six inches long by two feet ten inches wide. Two figures with retreating foreheads form the main subject, having the usual headdress of feathers, cape, collar, medallion, and maxtli. The taller of these two figures holds in each hand a large cross, while the other bears but one in his right hand. Rosettes and the arms of the crosses, a symbolic bird crowns the upper portion, while 23 cartoons are scattered about the bas relief. We think this a symbolic representation of Tlaloc, the Maya god of rain, whose chief attribute was a cross. Charnay, in his deeply interesting work, presents drawings of crosses found in the pre toltec city of Mitla, Mexico at Mayapan. Yucatan, and indeed of crosses found all over the land from the southern Guatemala to northern Mexico. Everywhere, even today, may be seen diversified forms of the cross, more or less artistically delineated on the walls of the temples, on ancient buildings, on galleries and natural rocks, in caves and on vases and pottery dug from the soil. In the pre-Columbian city of Palenque, Chiapas, there dominates the forest shrouded ruins of a remarkable building known to American antiquaries as the Temple of the Cross. This structure bears a striking resemblance in its dilapidation to an early Italian temple and an age probably antedates by many years the Roman Colosseum. The floors of the corridors and of many of the rooms are laid in cement as hard as the best seen in the remains of Roman buildings. These walls are about 10 feet high, and some carry the Greek cross, while others bear the Hebrew or Egyptian toff or tea. These crosses have occasioned much learned speculation. In the inner sanctuary of this temple was found 1783 a wonderful tablet in stone, now in the National Museum of Mexico City. It is called popularly the Palenque Cross, 
and archaeologically La Cruz and Ramada de Palenque. It is 11 feet wide by 6 feet high. It deserves to be examined closely. The man standing to the right of the cross and holding aloft a newly born babe is the god of fecundity, returning thanks to Votan, the Jupiter of the Mayas, for driving from the land the evil spirit of sterility. The opposite figure represents Juanafue, one of the gods who serves and ministers to the supreme god Votan. On his scarf is the Traverse Cross, emblematic of fertility among the Quiches, the Mayas, and of the all the semi-civilized or civilized races of Mexico and Central America, long before the coming of the Spaniard. All right. This was again here before the Spaniards, not a Christian symbol. It was also among the Egyptians, the symbol of the equinoxes or times of rain. The bird perched upon the cross and the Cuvite or royal quetzal sacred to the sun. The hieroglyphics on the left on the ta of the tablet, among them the Tao, have not to this day been deciphered. If we could read them, they perhaps would explain the full meaning of the representation and might furnish a clue to all the hieroglyphics on the ancient monuments of Mexico and Central America. They're saying if they could read Egyptian, they would be able to crack the code here in America. This tablet of the cross, with its mysterious figures and symbolic writing, has led to more learned speculation than any other relic. The calendar stone alone, except it found in the vast regions of Mexico and Yucatan, the French military explorer Captain Dupont's 1807 and his commentators believe Palenque belongs to a very remote antiquity and antedates by many years the Christian era. He accounts for the appearance of the cross among these ancient Americans on the assumption that it was known and had a symbolic meaning among pre-Christian nations long before it was established as the emblem of Christianity, okay? Long before Christianity. Go back up here to the statue of Hunafue in Palenque. So you guys can take a look. Desiree Charnay mentions another tablet of the cross found also at Palenque one panel of which is now in the Smithsonian Institute, Washington. The English archaeologist Alfred Maudsley, who in 1879 explored the ruins of Palenque, agrees with Charnay when he states that it was a shared symbol among nearly all ancient races in Asia and America, thousands of years before it was accepted as the symbol of the Christian faith at the time of Constantine. Conceding his contention to be true, we are then brought face to face with a problem of serious import, and that is, what did the cross stand for, or what did it symbolize to those ancient peoples and those lost civilizations? Without any way compromising my independence of thought or in identifying myself with any party, I am free to state that in my opinion, the pre-Columbian cross in America symbolized in the religious lives of the Mexicans and Mayas from the dim traditions which yet linger among the tribes of Central America, from the civilized Indians, and from conversations held with the priests ministering to these Indians, I am satisfied that the cross was the symbol of the God of rain, God of rain, of water, and fertility. I refer now to what we call the Greek cross, and not to the swastika, with which I will presently deal. The Mexican astronomer Pelagio Gama is of the opinion that the cross of Teotihuacan served for an astronomical expression of the vernal and autumnal equinoxes when days and nights are of the same length. The times, March 21st and September 22nd, when the sun in its revolution stops for a moment crossing the equator. It was to the cross that the dwellers on the Aztec Plateau made a pilgrimage to Cholula to invoke the help of Quetzalcoatl, god of the winds, and offer sacrifices to him that he might send down rain upon their parched land. Now I want to remind everybody, remember, they were offering fruits and grains, not like human sacrifice. This was already in their popo vu, what they were doing. At the foot of the cross, the people of Oaxaca offered their supplications to Botan, heart of the heavenly kingdom when their lands were parched with prolonged droughts and it was before the cross of Consumel, the Mayas and the Quiches stood when they petitioned their god Chuchulcan to send them rain and save their crops from the locusts and the hot wings, all right? 
the Temple of the Cross on the island of Consumel of the coast of Yucatan was frequented at times by such multitudes from Tabasco, Chiapas, Honduras, and Yucatan that paved roads were constructed from the distant towns to the shores where embarkation was made for Consumel, all right? There was highways, roads, constructions connecting all these Maya cities in the forest. They're finding them today with their LIDAR technology. It's going to take a hundred years for them, they said, or even more. It is singular and striking analogy that among the Egyptians in the time of Moses, the cross was also the symbol of rain and fertility, just like the Egyptians. Placed in the hand of Osiris, it was the emblem of spring, and in the hand of Isis, it represented autumn, and in the inundation of the Nile. In Yucatan, the crosses in the temples of Nakan, the god of dews, and the Toss, Toph, discovered in the ruins of Chichen Itza, symbolized the overflow of the waters of the Usumacinta, the Tabasco rivers, on the bordering lands. As the inundation of the Egyptian Nile is periodic and caused by the great rains falling on the mountains of Ethiopia, so the overflow of two rivers of the peninsula of Yucatan results from the rains which fall on the distant mountains of Cachumatanes. All right, and uh, take a look at this. All right, you can see what appears to be the swastika, right? But this is a Navajo altar floor, the swastika cross, you see? And we come here, it says the swastika cross. It was in Tucson, southern Arizona, 14 years ago when a jeweler showed me a strangely designed scarf pin he had made to the order of a lady, a guest at Santa Rita Hotel. It was fashioned in gold, and the design was peculiar and unique. The jeweler asked me if I had anywhere seen anything like it, and if so, by what name was it known? I answered that I had seen the design painted on Navajo blankets and on Sunni and Papago ceremonial articles on exhibition in the Anthropological Department of the Field Columbian Museum in Chicago. I could not tell him the name of the symbol or what it stood for. So far as I know, this strangely fashioned gold pen was the first of its kind made in the United States, and with it began the remarkable vogue which made the uncanny design a popular ornament as a belt buckle, brush, scarf, and hat pin. The jewelers and curio dealers will tell you now that his weird design with each of its four arms bent to a right angle is called the swastika, and that it is of Indian amulet conferring good luck and prosperity on the wearer. The Tucson jeweler had known of the wonderful properties of the thing he had just finished, might have sold a gross of the enchantment pins in a few weeks to the citizens of Arizona and to the tourists from the east. This mysterious symbol, wherever found in Europe, Asia, Northern Africa, or America, marks the migration of a great and numerous race of common origin or of common religious affiliations. It was the symbol of the water god, of the Gauls, and is known to French and German anthropologists of the Gramponi. Among the Scandinavians, it was the hammer of Thor, their war guard. It was cut into the temple stones dug by Sklilimn, from the ruins of Troy and burned into the terracotta urns found by Desiree Charnay in the pre-Toltec city of Teotihuacan, Mexico. It was an iconism of the ancient Phoenicians and was carved on the wall of the inner sanctuary of the Temple of Gigantia. It was chiseled thousands of years before the redemption by the Brahmins on the sacrificial stones in the cave of Elephanta, India. It is the highfold cross of Buddha and is seen today on the breast of Buddha in China and many of the ancient temples of India, Burma, Cambodia, Java, and Korea show a high development of the swastika and ornamental embellishment. Bishop Halun, Vicar Apostolic of the Upper Nile, says that it is a symbol of worship among the Ladakhs, a Buddhist community living in Gebel Silsi and in the land of Edfu, Egypt. When we search for it in Europe and America, we are surprised to learn that Cedric the Gaul carries it on the sail of his ship when he enters the port of Bali, Isle of Man, 150 years before the Christian era. It was venerated by the pagan Icelanders as a magic sign of the god of the winds and by the Celtic Druids in their forest rites in the oak groves of Ireland and Scotland. In a footnote on to the saga's first edition of Longfellow's poems, we are told that the 
Hammer of Thor, the Scandinavian god who gave his name to Thursday, was shaped like swastika. It was with this mighty hammer Thor crushed the head of the Midgard serpent and destroyed the giants. Longfellow, after recording the conversion to Christianity of King Olaf, tells us in charming verse how the king kept Christmas or Juletide at Drontheim. All right, and this is the story. It says, long after the conversion to Christianity of the Norsemen, the swastika hammer of Thor was retained in festival ceremonies and was often introduced into ecclesiastical decorations. The eminent Egyptologist Professor Edouard Naville, when excavated in 1912 in Abydos, the modern Arabat, Upper Egypt, tells us he found a swastika on the tomb of Osiris. And among the inscriptions and designs on tablets buried for 5,000 years in Upper and Lower Egypt. Professor Petrie says it is on the pictorial representation of the judgment of death, done something after Menes, the first of the pharaohs, became the god Osiris. Among the wonderful articles, paintings, statuary, and unfamiliar objects on exhibition in the Boston Museum, there is a large painting on silk. This is the Fuji, which 600 years ago hung in the Temple of Buddha, Japan. It pictures Buddha, seated on a throne of ivory and gold, surrounded by winged spirits, and higher up in the painting, two minor divinities. Between these two divinities, in the center of a golden ring is a brilliant swastika resting on a cushion of silk. It is sacred to Buddha, and is one of the marks by which his worshippers will know him when he returns to earth, all right, the swastika, Buddha. In the woven fabrics found in Swiss Lake, dwellings of Neolithic man, in Scandinavia, and in nearly all parts of Europe, we find a strange emblem. It is cut into the old Devonshire stones, a good specimen of which is in the Museum of Torquay in England. It was a sacred sign among the British Druids, and strangest of all among the ne Lotic Negroes. It is today found shaven upon the heads of locally famous warriors. All right, so before I continue, I wanted to show this example where they're talking about the symbol found like in this runic stone in Sealand. This is pre-Christian, all right? This is the cross of Cedric the Gaul, it says here. All right, you see the symbol. And this is a depiction of Buddha, as you guys can see here with the swastika right here. All right, statue of Buddha, colossal figure from China. And you can see the curly hair. You already know, so swarthy, ancient Asia. This is a terracotta urn from pre-Christian Sweden. All right, with the symbol as well, as you can see. Again, this is not a Nazi symbol. This is not a Christian symbol. It's existed thousands of years before that. This is another artifact. All right, you can see many different symbols here, the cross. Look at this symbol right here, down here. And the swastika as well. This is the Metter Cup. The Metter Cup, Celtic, Scottish. So now continue, it says, Turning now to ancient America, and looking over the known pre-Columbian world, we see the swastika on monuments, sacrificial altars, and on small, comparatively insignificant articles of pottery and molded ware. M. Desiree Charnay, as late as 1869 in his expedition to Mexico and Yucatan, dug up the now well-known Cross of Teotihuacan, which had been fashioned and set up in the once populous city by the Toltecs in honor of Tlaloc, their god of rain and fertility. Dr. Hammond, who read a paper before the Academy des Sciences No. 1882, supports M. Charnay in his contention that the cross everywhere in America symbolized water and fertility. Of the time when this cross was raised in Teotihuacan, we may only conjecture. All right, they don't know when they build this stuff. That would be conjecture. They're letting you know right here. They don't know what time this was made. That would be conjecture. The Mexico Spanish historian Torquemada writes that Tlaloc was the oldest of the Toltec gods. Certainly Tula and Teotihuacan seem to have been nearly Kuvo. Tula, according to the native historian Ixtli Xolchite, was founded AD 556. Clavijero has it at AD 667, while Vecchia makes it as late as AD 713. Even if we accept Vecchia's date, the cross is very old. At the base of this cross, when found, was a swastika, boldly sculptured and dedicated to Tezcatlipoca, the god of the winds. All right, this symbol is over here. 
in ancient America, okay? In the last edition of the Encyclopedia Americana, we read that the swastika has been exhumed from burial mounds within the limits of the United States. Baron von Humboldt and his voyages, Oaks of Regions, Equinoxes to Novo Continent, 1859, tells us in page 93, it was a conspicuous ornament on the tombs of the Incas of Peru, the swastika, okay? Professor Herbert F. Spinden, in his study of Maya art from 1913, assures us that everywhere in Yucatan in Central America, the swastika is found on the ancient buildings. It fills a conspicuous place in America today in the religious rites of the Navajos, the Sunni, the Papago Indians in New Mexico and Arizona. The sacred totem of the Crow Indians, both mountain and river men, and the swastika placed above two circles with another swastika on a disc in the center of a circle. Signs and symbols of primordial man, that's by Church Ward in 1910. The elaboration of this cross in ancient religious and ceremonial rites leading to identities in strange and mysterious features has proved to be one of the most singular phenomena of native culture in the New World and indeed in the Old nor has anyone been able to account for the perpetuity and universality of this obscure figure. Professor Black and John Fisk, late of Harvard, say it is phallic origin, but it bears no resemblance to the Cruz Ansara. All right? It's not really the same. The true phallic icon resting in the hands of Serapis at Sinape. All right? Look how they're trying to add Serapis to the crosses over here. I mean, look, look. They're saying, oh, it's the same phallic. No, it's not Serapis. This ain't her hermetics, uh-uh, this ain't Thoth. John Fisk and Professor Black, when given a phallic origin to the swastika, forget that nowhere in America has anything been found like that, okay? Or any tradition been handed down indicating the existence in the remote past of the people of phallic worship, all right? That's, that's on the other side of the world, all right? You guys keep that over there with that phallic stuff. Symbolism of the swastika. Among the ancient races of the old continents, and among the prehistoric southern Indians of North America, and among the early Peruvians, the swastika was the emblem of the sun and of the winds which blew from the four cardinal points. The god of the winds was the first offspring of the sun who was, at his rising in the east, saluted with the blazing torch. When the shaman, after saluting the sun, turned to the four points from which came the winds, he formed a cross, and the blaze blown by the winds fell away from the torch and formed the right angles which in time suggested the swastika. All right, you hear that? Let me illustrate my meaning. In the 10th letter of Father De Smet's Life and Travels Among the North American Indians, edited by Major Shitenden, there is an interesting account of the customs, religious rites, and habits of the Asini Boinis. The great missionary was a privileged guest when the salutation of the sun and the four winds and water occurred among the Asini Boinis. He writes, Sometimes three or four hundred lodges of families assemble in one locality. One sole individual is named the high priest and directs all ceremonies of the festival. After these preliminaries, the ceremony begins with an address and a prayer to the great spirit. He implores him to accept their gifts, to take pity on them, to save them from accidents and misfortunes of all kinds. All right, listen to that. Listen to what they're saying. They're praying to the great spirit. Then the priest holds aloft the smoking calumet to the great spirit, then to the sun, to each of the four cardinal points, and at each time to the earth. Writing of the Cheyenne's Colonel Henry Inman, one time scouting trailer with General Crook, informs us that this formidable tribe had no religion. If indeed we accept the respect paid to the pipe, and offering the pipe to the sun, the earth and the winds, the motion made in so doing by them describes the form of a cross. In blowing the first four whiffs, the smoke is invariably sent in the same four directions. Here then we have the rectangular cross coming down through the ages from the time when, in the Garden of Eden, the rivers crossed and made Eden a paradise of fertility and the swastika of Vedaic India retaining the basic cross but altered by the dip of the torch in the hand of the priest or by the blowing of the flame by the four winds which swastika symbolized all right so we're continuing the book discovery of the origin of the name of america by thomas de saint breeze it says we have an account of it from dr don luis fernandez piedrajita 
canon of the Metropolitan Church of Bogota, calificador of the Holy Office of the Supreme and General Inquisition and Bishop-elect of Santa Marta. This work was dedicated in the year 1688 to His Majesty, the King of Spain. And of the Indies, the bishop informs us that Kundin Amaraca, Kundin Amaraca, as the heathens called it, or the Indians, they called them heathens, right? Was the most important kingdom after Peru and Mexico. The chiefs of its population and the court of the barbarous king were at the capital, Bogota. So it seems the capital of Kundin Amaraca was in Bogota, right, in Colombia. To their idols of solid gold, they offered emeralds powdered with gold dust. The city had 20,000 houses in the days of its fame, and the king, with his 200 wives, resided in an immense palace guarded by 12 gates, which were entered by solid stone staircases. All right, so you think it was just teepees? All right, immense palace. All right, dumb diverses, right? They came to take your kingdoms, your dukedoms, your principalities, all right, your palaces. All right. The author explains the rites and ceremonies of the Moishkas under paganism and informs us that they that when they anyone died from the bite of a snake, that the sign of the cross was placed on the tomb, which is the American Peruvian sign for the word Amaru. Boom. Oh. Bow right there, man. I mean this correlates so much for me. Alright. So they put the sign of the cross. Anybody who got bit by a snake. And it says that this sign. All right. Is the Peruvian sign for the word Amaru. You see right here. You see the cross. Amaru. Amaru. And with the addition of the word Ka or land. Represents the sacred national name America. All right. Amaru. Ka. Amaru. God, the land of the cross or who are they talking about Amaru when they're talking about Amaru it's called the myths of Mexico and Peru by Louis Spence Quetzalcoatl it is highly probable that Quetzalcoatl was a deity of the pre Nahua people of Mexico I right? pre meaning before the Nahua says he was regarded as the father of the Toltecs and legend says that the seventh and youngest son of the Toltec Abraham each Tachimoshkuhot hmm Quetzalcoatl, whose name means feathered serpent or feathered staff, staff, the staff, became a relatively early period ruler of Tolan, and by his enlightened sway and his encouragement of the liberal arts did much to further the advancement of his people. Perhaps the most important of these is that which regards Quetzalcoatl as a god of the air. He is connected, say some, with the cardinal points and wears the insignia of the cross. He wears the insignia of the cross, which symbolizes them. Again, we're in the book Discovery of the Origin of the Name of America, right? We're still talking about the name of America, right? It says that they put the sign of the cross was placed on the tombs of people who got bit by snakes, which is the American Peruvian sign for the word Amaru. The cross is Amaru, is Quetzalcoatl, the cross, Amaru. And with the addition of the word ka or land represents the sacred national name America, Amaru, Amaru, the cross, the cross. We're in the book Anacalypsis, an attempt to draw aside the veil of the static Isis or the inquiry into the origin of the languages, nations, and religions by the late Je Godfrey Higgins, All right, volume 2, 1836. All right, and it says here, Quetzalcoatl. Cotle is represented in the paintings of the Codex Borgianus, right? So he's represented in the Mexican Codex, right? Nailed to the cross, nailed to the cross. Some sometimes even to two thieves are the crucified with him. So it says sometimes even two thieves are crucified with him, just like the story of Jesus, right? It's a coat, all right? In Volume Two, Plate Seventy Five, the God is crucified in the heavens in a circle of nineteen figures. The number of the metonic cycle. A serpent is depriving him of the organs of generation. In the Codex Borgianus, the Mexican god is represented crucified and nailed to the cross, and in another place hanging to it with a cross in his hands. And in one instance where the figure is not merely outlined, the cross is red. The clothes are colored, and the face and hands quite black. The face and hands quite black. 
if this was the Christianity of the German Nestorius, how came, how came he to teach that the crucified Savior was black? Oh, why didn't he teach that the Savior was so-called black or a Negro, right? Copper colored, right? Why didn't they teach that? You see what they're telling you? And these codices in the uh, Aztec and uh, these Mexican codices, right? Quetzalcoatl or the person being crucified, their savior, right? Who's being crucified is black or so-called black, a Negro person, all right? The name of the God who was crucified was Quetzalcoatl. Again, Quetzalcoatl. Uh, Atlantis, the antediluvian world. And this is by Ignatius Donnelly says in the great ditch surrounding the whole land like a circle and into which streams flow down from the mountains we probably see the original of the four rivers of paradise and the emblem of the cross surrounded by a circle which as we will show hereafter was from the earliest pre-christian ages accepted as the emblem of the garden of eden again the cross X marks the spot, right, of the Garden of Eden. So it marked where the Garden of Eden was or the energy point, the vortexes of the earth, the natural grid it has, right? Continuing in the book, all this cannot be a mere coincidence. It points to a common tradition of a variable land where four rivers flow down in opposite directions from a central mountain peak. And these four rivers flow into the north, south, east, and west constitute the origin of that sign of the cross all right the sign of the cross all right it's from the garden of eden it's not about christianity which we have seen meeting us at every point among the races who were either descended from the people of atlantis or who by commerce and colonization received their opinions and civilization from them the pyramid not only are the cross and the Garden of Eden identified with Atlantis, but in Atlantis, the habitation of the gods, we find the original model of all those pyramids, which extend from India to Peru. And what India is he talking about? When we ask the question how it comes that the sign of the cross has thus been reverenced from the highest antiquity by the races of the old and the new worlds, we learn that it is the reminiscence of the Garden of Eden, in other words, of Atlantis. Professor Harvick says, all these and similar traditions are but mocking satires of the old Hebrew story, words like Hebrew, one from the other side, which Hebrew means Eber, one from the other side. It's not a religion. You understand what I'm saying? Continuous as jarred and broken notes of the same strain, but with all their exaggerations, they intimate how in the background of man's vision lay a paradise of holy joy, a paradise secure from every kind of profanation and made inaccessible to the guilty, a paradise full of objects that were calculated to the delight of the senses and to elevate the mind, a paradise that granted to its tenant rich and rare immunities and that fed with its perennial streams the tree of life and immortality. Again, the tree of life, the cross. Right, Mount Moraine.